Okay, I am joined today by the former Penn State president, Dr. Graham Spanier. Dr. Dr. Spanier, how are you? Good, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on and chat with me. Um, I I got the wild idea to interview after reading your book. I said, I'll just reach out and take a shot at it, and, uh, and I'll be doggone if you weren't kind enough to take the time and have a discussion with it. I, I greatly appreciate it. Sure, happy to do it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, probably a simple, obvious question, but why'd you go ahead and write the book? Well, at first, I never wanted to write about it at all, never wanted to write a book. But as things were unfolding more than a decade ago with members of Penn State's Board of Trustees, their general counsel, Louis Free, who was brought in to do an investigation, prosecutors. Uh, and as I was reading depositions and various lawsuits, it just struck me that nobody was telling the truth. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit. A lot of people were telling the truth, but a lot of people were not. And I thought somebody has got to write this down, keep track of things, because as a matter of history, the truth must be told, justice must be done. And I was in the middle of it. So uh, not only did I have information to begin with and knew what was going on, but I was following it very closely and keeping track of it, thousands of pages of materials and, and uh, I started writing the book. It took some years to finish because things kept unfolding. Uh, I can I can only imagine. Of course, you document it so well in the book. The book is in, in the lion's den, and it's it's just a wonderful, wonderful read. Um, so let's let's go back. One of the reasons I personally wanted to reach out to you is I'm an independent broadcaster and I'm uh, and uh, and an amateur journalist, as you can tell. And so uh, one of the reasons I wanted to reach out to you is as reading this book, you have a journalistic background that I, that I was unaware of. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you go into more about that? Well, it, it started uh, when I was a teenager. Uh, I began working in radio and, and television. Uh, I grew up in the Chicago area and uh, a good friend of mine, still my best friend <laughs> to, to this day was uh, Brian Ross, who uh, did become an investigative reporter, a uh, very decorated journalist. And uh, we had uh, some radio shows uh, when we were teenagers, and uh, we had a television show uh, for a while. And so, uh, yeah, we we were doing that. Uh, I guess you could call that broadcast journalism. But beyond that, we uh, he was the editor in chief of the high school newspaper. And I was one of the two sports editors. And we put out a newspaper every week. And I covered sports for Chicago area newspapers during my teenage years. So yeah, I spent a lot of time doing journalism related things. And so what advice would you give to anyone that's looking looking to break into journalism or broadcasting? I, I think the advice is to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, learn as much as you can about the profession, stay in tune with the news, decide what you want to focus on, uh, certainly learn how to write. Uh, I learned more from taking classes in journalism, actually, than I did probably in English, because it's there where I learned to edit, to focus on grammar, uh, to be very uh, true to details. Uh, I would also give this advice, uh, and, and I talk about this in my book. I have a chapter called Media Culpa. And I talked throughout the book about what the media was up to while uh, I was going uh, through the ordeal I was going through for years. Um, I don't think there are reporters who are out 
to get it wrong. Uh, I, I think they're all committed to getting it right, but there are good reporters and bad reporters. And some start every story with their point of view and not with the facts. Even to this day, I mean, in the last week, I was being harassed by a reporter 10 years later for kind of nasty emails from him demanding answers to certain things. I answered the first two, I gave him the answers, but it didn't mesh with the story he wanted to tell. So he wrote a pretty negative story. And I've seen that throughout, that a lot of what uh, reporters want to pass as objective journalism really has a point of view. And that's probably okay if you represent it to be something that has a point of view, more like an op-ed or an editorial or an opinion, as opposed to having that passed off as news, as facts, as accurate information when it isn't. That's very troublesome. And you go into great detail uh, about what you consider a, a rush to judgment and a miscarriage of, of justice. What do you think the biggest mistake made by the media was during that whole ordeal when that uh, when everything uh, came kind of crumbling down? I can only imagine what your world was like in, in November of 2011. What do you think the biggest mistake was in your view now looking back uh, all these years later? Well, I think the biggest mistake was a rush to judgment. Um, and by I'll be more specific about it. Uh, when you have a big news item and there are dozens of reporters, maybe as many as 200 at Penn State who came into town, there wasn't much information because the people who said they were managing the crisis weren't really managing it. And so the media pours in because they think it's going to be a big story and they start filling the gaps by picking up rumors, by picking up anybody off the street who will say something, by filling the gaps and feeling a great need to be the first to report. So what we see today is a lot of, uh, you turn on the, the cable news networks at any time, uh, e even in newspaper stories that will come out a day later, but certainly in social media and blogs and tweets from reporters, you see phrases like breaking news, even though it might be six at night and the news came out at eight in the morning, breaking news, exclusive, first to report, so-and-so our paper or our network has learned as if we've learned it and nobody else has. Um, you get a lot of that um, a frenzy, a, a real media frenzy around a story, and uh, it's not always right. In fact, it's often wrong. The other thing that happens is you have certain reporters who get themselves into favored positions with sources, and they get leaks, uh, and they believe what they're hearing, and they don't check it with a second source. They don't check the veracity of what they're hearing. And so they go with what a source is saying uh, without questioning, why is that source telling me that information? And can I believe it? And what is the motive for that being leaked to me? These are all things that play into uh, media not always getting it right. Did you have a sense of that uh, prior to 2011 that there was there that there was this kind of rush to be the first to report, or was the uh, was the Jerry Sandusky scandal the first thing that really opened you up to the fact of um, it was frankly a, a just a a cavalcade of reporters just looking to report whatever they thought they could was that the first time you were opened up to uh, just no, it, that rush to judgment. Yeah, I think it's been evolving over two, maybe three decades uh, in in the media. And uh, I, I think what 
social media has really accelerated everything because now if you're studying to be a journalist, uh, you realize you're not developing a story over a period of time and having editors look at it and and uh, uh, then putting it out there. You Today's journalists, let's say you're a broadcast journalist, before you go on ABC or CBS or NBC or CNN, they're all putting out tweets. They're putting out stories that uh, are being pushed out electronically. And so it, it everything has become rushed. And that's been happening over the last couple of decades. So we've been seeing that for a while. But where we really see it in big time is when it's something of a crisis nature or where there's so many people on the story that uh, you're rushing around trying trying to be uh, to be out there. And when, when this whole saga uh, unfurled at Penn State, when a, a former assistant football coach who had retired 13 years earlier, but no longer had any connection to Penn State, was uh, in a, a grand jury presentment, they call it, an, an indictment, um, it morphed into a story not about this individual and what he was accused of, but it became a story about Penn State University, about our head football coach, Joe Paterno, about the university administration, about the values of the university. And uh, so many reporters descended on the story that it was allowed to, to get out of control very quickly. Uh, very early on. And uh, what I often say is it's very hard to get the toothpaste back into the tube. So what people around the country tend to believe is what they first hear. And this became so sensationalized that you had, for example, the newspaper in Pennsylvania that covers state government from the state capitol, a very large newspaper enterprise, um, put out a front page editorial demanding that our revered head coach, who everybody knows now did nothing wrong, uh, that he and the president of the university, me, I hadn't been charged with anything then, uh, that we be fired. And People jumped on that bang, bandwagon. It was like uh, a locomotive that gets going. You know, it it's a big, heavy uh, piece of machinery. And it starts off very slowly. But once a locomotive gets going, it is almost impossible to stop or slow down. I mean, it takes a while to get it to slow down. And uh, once it gets going, it, it it's hard to stop. You ne would need a very powerful force to be able to stop it. And not only was it not being stopped, it was picking up steam and people were being thrown on the tracks in front of it. Uh, and, and that's how I see it. Uh, and personally, I think that's an accurate point of view. How different do you think the narrative would be had you not been silenced by the board of trustees and the powers that be, had Joe Paterno's health not failed and kind of been able to to battle that narrative? He was in the middle of, of cancer treatment, of course, so that, that took all his energy and time. If you and your colleagues weren't silenced, if Paterno's health doesn't fail, how different do you think the narrative would be now? You know, it's hard to know for sure, uh, but it would have been somewhat different. It would have had to have been because uh, as the president of a university, uh, I had been a university president for more than 20 years. Uh, my life was dealing with crises. There's a crisis every day in an institution as big and complex as Penn State. 
I, I was very good at it. And be, probably because of my journalistic background, because I was a television talk show host, because I was writing for magazines and newspapers on a regular basis, I was pretty good at communicating. But I was under a gag order from my governing board not to do or say anything. And so was Joe Paterno. He was prepared to address this right away at a, his Tuesday morning news conference that he would have had as soon as this news broke. And he was told by the de facto chair of the board of trustees that he had to cancel his news conference and couldn't say anything. So yes, his health declined significantly uh, after that, but uh, if Joe Paterno and I each had been allowed to talk about this, uh, I don't know in the end if it would have been very different, but certainly it would have slowed things down. We could have said we're on top of this. We are looking into it. We will get the truth out. We will communicate with you. When nobody's communicating, then the media, they're all there in town. They've got their hotel rooms. They set up tents to broadcast like ESPN would on a game day. Um, uh, satellite trucks are closing off st the streets for a couple of streets for satellite trucks. Um, yeah, it, it probably would have been different if we could have gotten out in front of it, but we weren't allowed to. And, uh, of course, we're talking about uh, the legendary coach Joe Paterno and his health failing. Uh, how in touch were you with him during the final months in, of his life? I know that you both had so much going on and, and were swarmed in a, a media firestorm. So during those last months where he was battling uh, lung cancer, how in touch were you guys, if at all? Well, uh, we were frequently in touch uh, about all kinds of things. Uh up until this news came out. Then when it came out and we got the gag orders, uh, no, we we weren't in touch. After we both lost our jobs, uh, we, we didn't have a chance to talk again. And uh, it, it really wasn't months. It was just a few weeks because Joe died. Uh, this all happened. Uh, in uh, the first half of November of 2011, and uh, he was hospitalized not too long after that and died in uh, January. So uh, we, we never had a chance to say our goodbyes or, or to talk about it. How did, his, uh, how did his death affect you, especially under those circumstances? Uh, I was out of town and um, visiting Penn State alumni and donors. Uh, I was in California at the time. And uh, after I lost my job, uh, many of our major donors and, and alumni uh, asked me to come visit because they were very upset that Joe Paterno had been fired and that the board uh, that I felt I needed to resign and the board accepted my resignation. Um, and so I was in California at the time visiting folks. I heard the news. Uh, I, I issued a statement uh, and it it was uh, reported by some of the journalists. Um, but I, I was stunned. Uh, I knew that he was ill. I knew he'd, he'd been hospitalized. Uh, but it really surprised me that he died so quickly. I, I think what the university did to him, frankly, killed him. I mean, he, he did have lung cancer, and he would have died at some point. But the devastation of this to, to him personally, I, I think, killed him. And it, it, was, it, it had to be devastating to him, and I, I, I know it was. And, you know, it was devastating to me as well. I, I don't think there's a, a head football coach and a university president that had as good a relationship as Joe Paterno and I did. Now, Joe could be a handful. He had strong opinions, um, but he was very respectful of me as president, that I was 
the leader of the university. We consulted with each other on certain matters, athletics, fundraising, NCAA legislation. We never talked about football. What what would I say about <laughs> football? Never talked about that. Um, but it was a great relationship. And, um, you know, I was in his home many times. He was in my home many times. We were in meetings together. Uh, we... I, I talk in the book about a, a ritual that we had where I would bring potential major donors, <laughs> VIPs, onto the field before the game. It was an experience to, to have, you know, more than 100,000 people all around you. I would never be there during the game. I, I never interfered. But before the game, I would come down to show people what the whole phenomenon was like. Joe would always spot me on the sideline and my, he would come over, talk to my guests. He could connect with anybody, whether it was a U.S. Supreme Court justice or uh, a billionaire. <laughs> and he always could warm up to them and talk to them. And we had a photographer there uh, from our uh, university relations office, and she took some pictures She'd have them developed on Sunday, bring them in to me Monday morning. I would send them with a note to the people in the pictures. We raised millions of dollars that way. And Joe knew that that was important to the university. Uh, and it was a sign of respect for the president and his guests. Um, so I thought the world of Joe and during that last year, during 2011, whenever we were meeting, I, I would notice he had a little cough, just a little cough. And I thought, oh, you know, he's 85 years old, so whatever. Um, but I, it, it, I would have never imagined that deep down inside he had lung cancer and then that, that could ultimately uh, be the cause of his death. Uh, and, of course, you talk in the book also about the fact that in 2011, a gr an agreement was made uh, privately long before uh, any scandal was was any a thought that it was going to be uh, Joe Paterno's final season as, as the head coach. Um, was it absolutely definitely going to be his, his final season or was there kind of some wiggle room there that eh, maybe no. I'll I'll uh, come on back? No, there, there was no wiggle room. Um you know, in the years leading up to it, Joe was always saying, what am I going to do? Play golf? So he was always thinking about retiring, but never really wanted to. And in 2011, actually kind of early in 2011, uh, we started talking about it. He, he wanted to talk about it. And I would say by June of that year, uh, he had made up his mind. And over the summer, we uh, had a, uh, we signed an agreement. It was only about one page, but it laid out the process. Um, and uh, he signed it, and it was his ironclad retirement agreement. There was there was no wiggle room. It it was planned. In fact, you know, we had a discussion once uh, where I said, Joe. Let's announce it at the beginning of this. This was after the agreement was signed. Let's announce it at the beginning of the season because you'll be celebrated everywhere we play. It, it is. It would be such a wonderful thing for all the schools where you've played over the years, and the, you know, the the, the schools, the away games will be at that year. You know, let them do what they would want to do, which was to celebrate your incredible career. And he said, no don't want that. I want to announce it at the end of the season. He didn't want any fault or all. When the, after the last game, then we'll announce it. And that's why in the agreement, the first statement is Joe will announce it. He will have the right to announce his retirement at the end of the season. And uh, I, I really regret that he was not allowed to do that, that with just three games remaining, he was fired, not just at the end of the season, but effective immediately. And 
by the board doing that, they really communicated to the world, okay, we think he's guilty of something. We think he's so guilty, he has to be removed effective this moment. That really stung. I mean, it, it had to have stung Joe. Certainly it stung me, our athletic director, Tim Curley, and the students were just very upset. Almost, I mean, Penn State alumni everywhere were upset by that. And, you know, they poured into the streets and uh, there was some bad behavior yeah. over it. Uh, let, let's talk about those, uh, those, uh, you know, those protests that, that sometimes got out of hand and, and it, it was a wild scene to watch from afar. Uh, what was, what was your reaction? What, you know, internally how did you feel watching uh just completely out of character behavior for penn state at the university and everything kind of crumbling down you know i'd seen it a couple of times before we we had a couple of episodes like that in the late 90s or so and uh i i just it really bothered me uh i i wish it hadn't happened. I could understand, you, you You know, you pour into the streets and you can have a peaceful protest and say what you want to say. But when you start pulling down a, a light pole or, you know, damaging a, a vehicle, that's not right. I, I can't support that at all. It bothered me. But at that point, this is late on a Wednesday night, uh, I had submitted my resignation uh, that morning and told the board leadership that it was irrevocable. And at a meeting that night, they accepted my resignation under a, a clause in my contract um, called termination without cause. In other words, you didn't do anything wrong, but we're agreeing that you're no longer in your position. And um, I was helpless to, to manage the crisis, the riot, it, it was in the hands of others. And, uh, you know, after you have managed a lot of crises, uh, you want, your instinct is to get out there and handle it, do what you can and speak about it. Uh, and when you can't, you feel very helpless. And I, I certainly did. I felt badly for the university. You, you know, you talk about the fact that that you, you resigned. There was this quick narrative that you, along with Joe Paterno, was fired. How frustrating was that for you? And in the, in the reality of they they threw you under the bus with Joe in terms of that that meant guilt. How frustrating was that for you? It was very frustrating because at the news conference where John Surma announced Joe Paterno's firing. Uh, he used language that was very tricky, I think. He said, Graham Spanier and the Board of Trustees have agreed that he is no longer president of Penn State and effective immediately, Joe Paterno is no longer the head football coach. So it was clear they were firing Joe. But by putting me into the same sentence or paragraph, they gave the impression that I was fired, which is what I think they he wanted to give. So that is what the media picked up on. And for weeks, in fact, for months, and maybe even for years, the narrative was I was fired. Today, when people write about it, they still write that I was fired. Uh, they were saying that, and in fact, they then started actually using the words fired uh, as they got deeper into defending themselves or removed or wh whatever they were saying. And I wrote the chairman and the vice chairman of the board and said, you two know that this is wrong. And I would like you to correct it. This is not fair that you're saying that. They they never corrected it. In fact, they, they never even answered my emails. That's got to be so incredibly frustrating because throughout the book, you tell stories of people that that frankly you helped. Uh, you know, you helped 
advance their career in the right way. And it felt as though when when the, the Jerry Sandusky scandal happened, they just completely turned against you and gave you no benefit of the doubt. I mean, that had to be just earth shattering. Yes, it was. Um, it wasn't everybody. I, I had uh, a few members of the board quietly saying nice things to me, but it was very quiet, you know, sending me a note or whispering to me in a phone conversation something. Uh, one member of the board, uh, she felt that her phone was probably being tapped and she went to a, a friend's house and used his phone to call me up to talk. Uh, so there were a few board members who were somewhat sympathetic, even though none of them at the time stood up publicly and said, this is wrong what the board's doing. Uh, they all followed along. Now, there were some members of the university administration who uh, stopped speaking to me, but I have come to learn that they were under orders from lawyers not to talk to me. They were actually, and I have the documentation, uh, they were told, you are forbidden from speaking to Joe Paterno or Graham Spanier. So I understand that. In recent years, some of those folks have reached back out to me. Just this morning, I set up a breakfast with one of them who hasn't spoken to me during that decade. <laughs> now is he's read the book and he would like to talk uh, and get back together and be on good terms again. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of devastating to me, but I understood it. I understood why they felt that they couldn't support me or, or talk to me. Now, there was one member of the administration, one of the vice presidents who was seeing all of this happening and hearing things behind closed doors that he he, he knew was, was wrong. And he basically got up and left the president's conference room one day and never came back. Uh, took another job. He's now a university president. Um, so, and some of them were quietly coming over to my home, bringing me casseroles, bringing me pizzas. So it, it you had a whole continuum of people being somewhat unsupportive to very supportive. No one, as far as I know, outright turning on me, but the, the better way of putting it is just holding me at a distance. Uh, and But members of the Board of Trustees who came under criticism for firing Joe Paterno and letting me go, uh, I haven't heard from very many of those folks. No, nobody's apologizing. And uh, they kind of dug themselves in deeper. Um, at this point, would an apology from the trustees uh, mean a lot to you if that if that day ever comes? Sure, that would mean something. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't hold grudges. I try to see things from the perspective of other people. Uh, anybody who has come up to me and said that they're so sorry about something or you know, whatever it might be, uh, or have implied an apology, I, I've accepted it and, and forgiven them. But I'm not in my mind forgiving people who have not asked for forgiveness. <laughs> I mean, let them, <laughs> uh, you know, if, if they came forward and said, I'm so sorry, what I did, or how I treated you, or how I related to you, I would say, you know, it was painful and I understand and thank you for saying what you're saying and I forgive you. <laughs> I I can't agree with what you did, but, you know, I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm, 
I'm, I'm trying to be positive about everything. Looking back now that we're now now that we're so many years beyond it, what do you think the the biggest misconception of the Jerry Sandusky scandal is? Well, the biggest misconception is that people knew that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile. I mean, to this day, there are a lot of people who believe that Jerry Sandusky is innocent, and. Uh, now, almost everybody who knows anything about it agrees he did not get a fair trial. But is he a pedophile? There's a lot of disagreement about that. But people say, yeah, but he was found guilty of so many things. Well, yes, he was. But first of all, he was found not guilty of three charges that relate to the shower incident at Penn State that kind of turned the story to Penn State. And... uh he has filed an appeal that with some expert testimony, uh, expert witness testimony that is somewhat persuasive. But apart from Jerry Sandusky, the biggest, and, and I say in my book, this book is not about Jerry Sandusky and his guilt or innocence. It's what happened at Penn State and what happened to me. And so what I can say about that is that the biggest misconception is that people in positions of authority, responsibility, respect at Penn State knew that something bad was happening, that children were being abused. That's absolutely untrue. Joe Paterno, Gary Schultz, Tim Curley, Graham Spanier, I am 100% convinced that none of us ever suspected what Louis Free and others and prosecutors later charged us with. I know I didn't. I know Gary Schultz and Tim Curley never told me anything along those lines. They have said so through their attorneys and publicly. They have said so under oath uh, as witnesses. Uh, we know from many different accounts that Joe Paterno never suspected anything like that. So the biggest misconception is that people at, at, at Penn State somehow knew something and were engaged in a cover-up. That, that narrative is absurd. It's just plain wrong. And in the free report, as it's come to be known, it's what I call a work of fiction. Uh, of course, so much of this started when uh, originally it was in 2002, some say 2001, some have it narrowed down to, in your book, you have it narrowed down to the final week of December in 2000. What exactly do you think Mike McQuarrie might have told Joe Paterno? Because so many people are stuck on whatever did or did not take place during that meeting. Well, we know that prosecutors got the time of that meeting wrong. They later admitted that and changed it. And even the date they changed it to, there's some pretty compelling evidence that that's wrong because of what else was supposed to be happening on campus that night, uh, what was happening on campus that night. And it, it just, it doesn't add up. So we think we know now when it was, it, it, it was, um, yes, in, in, uh, late December of 2000. Um, and we know from a number of different angles what Mike McQuarrie told Joe Paterno that night. Certainly we, we have Mike McQuarrie's testimony, I believe five different testimonies. They're all a little different. He kept changing his story, but he acknowledged that he never told Joe Paterno anything about anal rape or sodomy or uh, the sexual abuse of a child. So McQuarrie has said that. Uh, we know from members of Paterno's family what occurred. Uh, we know from uh a friend of the family's who was a former player under Joe Paterno, when he went to talk to Joe, what he said to that person 
nothing occurred. We know what Frank O'Harris has found out, the, the now late Frank O'Harris, I'm sorry to say, who you know, spent a decade finding out the truth and being committed to it. Uh, we know from many different directions that Joe Paterno never heard a report about the sexual abuse of a child in the shower. And we know that Mike McQuarrie, when he told his father and his father's boss, who is a mandated reporter, uh, that he had gone to see Joe Paterno to say that he was uncomfortable uh, with a glimpse he caught in the shower in a, a couple of seconds, but he wasn't sure what he saw because it was indirect and around a corner, that this mandated reporter, a board certified physician in internal medicine who headed up the medical practice that uh, Mike McQuarrie's father worked for, he asked him three times, and he has testified to this under oath, uh, did you see anything sexual? And three times, McQuarrie said no. So that's about from five different directions <laughs> we have have that report. And, uh, and of course, Tim Curley and Gary Schultz spoke to Mike McQuarrie after they got a report, uh, after Tim Curley got a report from Joe Paterno, and nothing like that was said to them in that discussion either by Mike McQuarrie. And that was pretty soon after all of this unfolded. Why do you think that uh, that more hasn't been done to kind of correct the narrative and paint a more fair picture? Uh, so many people are, are, especially outside of State College, and I, I'm in Columbus, Ohio, so I I hear the outside of State College narrative that has made great progress. Uh, but But overall, people who aren't tied to Penn State and still paying attention to the story – why do you think more hasn't been done by the national media to kind of correct that narrative? Because so much more has come out since those those fateful events of, of November 2011, and yet so many people are still stuck on that same story. Yes, good question. Well, a tremendous amount has been done to correct the narrative. There, there is tremendous amount of evidence now, amazing to me, that some people have devoted years, so much of their time to get the truth out. It, it is available, it's out there. And in my book, I talk about some of these folks who I consider heroes, who are absolutely dedicated to getting the truth out. But the national media, the mainstream media, if you wanna call them that, has been afraid to correct this. They've either been afraid or they're not interested or they've moved on. I've seen it all. I have uh, been interviewed for hours, for hours, for to print journalists, magazine journalists, broadcast journalists. I've been interviewed over and over and over again by people who when they first approach me, and I talk about this a little in the book, said, I know we got the story wrong, and now we want to get it right. And they do all their interviews, and now they've got, and they are very well informed, and they know now what the truth is. They go back to their editors. They go back to the executives in the media companies. They go back to the lawyers and salespeople in the media companies, and they are told, no, we're killing that story. Or you can put a little bit on, but it's got to be what they consider balanced. And by balanced, they mean we want you to tell all of the old existing narrative. And then you can just put a little bit in there that maybe you didn't get it right. It has been really a phenomenal thing to see the reluctance of the mainstream media to go back and fix what they got wrong to begin with. And I have seen them go up to the 11th hour, <laughs> to 11.59, you know, with a, a national magazine that was going to be the cover story. And it was all written and ready to go. And a new editor 
came in, killed the story right away. I have seen the hours of interviews, the the tens of thousands of dollars that have been spent on uh, producing a new story that I thought, oh, that's going to be great. It was killed um, or or substantially changed. It, it's that that that's what's been going on, and I realize um, it's very hard to change a headline once it's out there. You have to be pretty brave too to be willing to do it. So what I've also seen is some journalists who got the story wrong and instead of looking at the new evidence and being willing to correct the story, they de dig their heels in further. They, 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 it's important to them and their career to the prizes they've won and the recognition they've received to stick to the narrative at all costs. Well, I think it, uh, you know, on, on a personal note, I think it goes to that old saying, I, I believe it's something along the lines of it's easier to dupe an individual than it is to convince a person they've been duped, uh, you know, at, at, to and to some extent, because I personally look, look at it and I go, it, it's so tough sometimes when we get attached to inner narratives and, and we just decide that's the truth, even if deep in our heart we might know it isn't. How frustrating is that for you to see going to that uh, that eleventh hour that that all right this this could change a little bit of the story and and then it gets killed. I mean that's got to be just so so beyond the pale in terms of frustration. Yes, um, <laughs> you know you you can get yourself very excited about okay finally a national network is committed to a. Uh, you know, a multi-part or a two hours long show that is going to fix this, and then they don't. Um, and you're comparing notes with the other people who are being interviewed, saying, have you heard? When are they putting it on? And they postpone it for weeks and then months. And then finally, what they put on is a, is a little thing that's wrong. Very frustrating. At this point in my life, uh, frankly, I don't believe that the narrative will ever change or be fixed. I, I I just think there was too much radioactivity. That's the term I'll use. Too much radioactivity early on for it to be changed. Now, I've gotten thousands of emails from people who are very supportive and they understand the truth and and. And after reading my book, they're even more supportive. I've gotten probably 400, maybe 500 emails from people about my book. They they continue to come in every day. I've, I've spoken more than 30 venues around the country. I have four coming up, four more coming up in the next two weeks. I had one last Saturday in um, out of state. And um, we've had... More than a thousand, maybe twelve hundred people showing up at these events, and it's been very affirming, very supportive. These people who have either read the book or understand the facts, they they're very supportive. But there are so many people out there who, you know, will never read the book or their minds made up, and that they won't change their mind. And I I don't know what more I can do other than interviews like this, which I'm happy to do. And uh, I've done a lot of them and they've shown up in dozens of places. Uh, and, um, you know, having written my book and putting it out there, I say in the beginning of the book, I have a, a early on, you've seen it, disclaimer. I said, I, I talk about what my sources are for the book. And I also say in there, if anybody can find anything in this book that is not factually correct, that is not backed up by evidence, tell me and I will gladly correct it. Do you know how many people out of thousands of books sold now and interviews done, how, how many people have tried to correct something? Zero. 
nobody has come forward and said, that's wrong. You need to fix it. None of the 40 people I list in the appendix of the book who were culprits at some level or another, who you would think would say to me, that's not fair what you said about me, that's not right. Nobody's done that. So uh, I know I, I have a, another commitment in, in a little bit. So I, I just want to find out if you have another question or two, I'd be happy to answer it before we sign off. Absolutely. Uh, just a, just another other question. What do you want your legacy to be? Your, you, your time as president of Penn State transformed the university into, a, you know, it was always a household name. But you, your presidency, I think it's fair to say, brought it into the stratosphere. What do you want your legacy to be? Well, thank you for saying what you said. And, uh, you know, I would like my legacy to to focus on the leadership I provided for American higher education and for Penn State, for work I did in the national security arena. I mean, all things I've been honored for, but uh, not recognized by the university since I, I stepped down. Um, I I know... I, I hear from alumni all the time and from former students how they appreciated my leadership. So I, I think I'd like the legacy to focus on that. Will it happen at the university? I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. Um, and, you know, the, like I, I mentioned, the reporter that harangued me over this past week He's got an idea in his head and he's writing about it. He's never going to change his mind. Uh, somebody wrote a letter to the editor of that publication saying, shouldn't you have read Spanier's book before you went ahead, you know, half cocked with, with this thing? I called him out for, you know, what some might consider yellow journalism. Um, but... Uh, there are going to be continue to be stories like that because people don't do their homework or they will never change their mind or they've done a little bit of homework and they read a news story from 10 years ago that said one thing or another. And that's what they believe and what they've latched on to. Two more questions, Dr. Spanier. What do you say to those that refuse to change their mind, if anything? Well, I don't have discussions with those people. Mm -hmm. They they don't they don't reach out to me. They don't really want to talk to me. Um, so I, I really haven't had much opportunity along that line. Most of my feedback and most of my discussions are with people who are supportive. Now I've had interviews with journalists in formats like this, many of them, who ask tough questions, you know, really tough questions questions, but I have answers for all of them. I would welcome questions like that if they're willing to hear me out and check up on what I say, you know, bring it on. And then finally, uh, before we let you go, what's the future look like for you? What What are you doing now? And uh, what more do you intend to do to, if you, if you intend to do anything to try oh, yeah. and continue to change this narrative? Well, my retirement as a university president was very abrupt and I had just had my contract renewed uh, by the board and you know I I'm not a retirement kind of guy so I have been very busy uh, I've tried to continue to help the university in every way I could I do guest lectures uh, if development officers have reached out to me for help in fundraising I help them. I help everybody. I mentor people still in higher education. I do consult at some universities still. And uh, I do some work in the national security arena, which is an area I had leadership for on behalf of American higher education. While I was president, I'm still doing some work in that arena. Well, Dr. Spanier, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me. It's been a pleasure. I, I've learned so much. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. I have. Thank you. And uh, if you think you know the entire truth about the Jerry Sandusky scandal, please get Dr. Spanier's book, In the Lion's Den, The Penn State Scandal and a Rush to Judgment. Please, please, please give it a read. I, 
no matter what your opinion is on it, it will open your eyes to some things. I, I guarantee you that. So again, thank you, Dr. Spanier, so much. Thank you. So long.